sexual device There lies a seed Dormant and waiting to be Released somewhere between 18 months and 2 years It will sprout And begin to choke the life out And if you What we're talking about You press the power button And what happened was nothing iTunes won't even see it Now you wish you warranted it The doom seed has germinated Your iPod shall not be resuscitated Figure out what you gon' do with your dead iPod Write a eulogy and bury it in your backyard Even though it's broke, just pretend like it's not To avoid conversation with strangers at the bus stop Use it as a weapon if you're being attacked You know what? On second thought, scratch that Tape it to your body, call it a bot switch Put it in a hoagie, call it an iPod witch A paperweight is lame unless there's a fan on your desk And even in that case, a manhole cover works best Keep it simple, cause less is more. Put it in a shoebox in the back of a drawer. Then 50 years from today, your grandkids will find it and say, You listen to music on this? You mean when you were a kid, you didn't have music uploaded directly to your brain? And you'll say, No, we just had iPods. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, another lecture in physics and everyday life and conceptual physics. We are getting towards the end. Hope you are doing reasonably well out there and uh, looking forward to the end of the semester. I know I think everybody is, self-included, um, but I hope uh, that you've been reasonably successful at making it through to the end of your courses. We're going to have three more lectures next week. Uh, and then we have the final exam scheduled for finals week. I'll be releasing details about that uh, in an email, so look for that announcement. So we today we want to talk about you know sort of the rest of the story about how we record and share and listen to music. So last time we talked about sort of the advent of sound recording as a medium back in the late 1800s when people were experiencing uh, experience experimenting, rather, with uh, systems that would mechanically etch waveforms onto some sort of soft medium like a wax cylinder and then play it back if you got a stylus to follow that same groove. Uh, things moved a lot when electrical signals were uh, part of the game. Uh, suddenly folks had engineered things like microphones, speakers, figured out how to, to amplify sound so that it could be uh, louder than it was on the capture. We came a long way in storage when people figured out how to encode information within magnetic domains on magnetic tapes at first, and then later on magnetic hard drives, which uh, were the dominant way to store information on computers until just a few years ago. And you may very well have computers still that have magnetic hard drives. I know I do. Uh, and then finally, encoding information in a digital fashion uh, and uh, mainly the idea of how information is encoded on CDs and DVDs using a digital system of binary numbers, pits and lands on the surface of the CD, and a laser is used to read that information by shining up on the surface. And because it reflects uh, with different distances off of just land or a combination of pit and land, uh, that information is an optical one or a zero, a bright spot or a dark spot, and can be read back uh, by the audio player. So uh, this is probably most of your lifetime. Uh, so, you know, you may not have been aware of the first iPod, but I can still distinctly remember heading off to graduate school in the fall of 2001, and then my advisor getting one of these first generation iPods that's up there next to the title. Um, and, you know, suddenly there was this strange world of iTunes and music was on the computer. And what was that all about? Uh, the first generation iPod, I believe, um, cost somewhere around 
five hundred dollars for the top end version of it, uh, and again, that's twenty years ago, so fairly expensive. Uh, and then, you know, very quickly, as is the Apple model, new generations of these things came out with new features, better battery life, more ability to store things. They came out with different series of iPods. Uh, I fondly remember the shuffles. I have th three dead shuffles in the drawer upstairs, the small one down there at the bottom, because I liked it. It was the least weight to carry around when you're at the gym or something. Um, and they even made the iPod Touch, and I actually still listen to music on my wife's old iPod Touch from a few years back. Um, this was based on the iPhone technology, but now I, I would say standalone audio players are kind of becoming a thing of the past since most people probably listen to music on their phone since the phone has sort of taken over all of these device functions. Uh, but nonetheless, this was a revolution in the way that music was recorded and shared. And the iPod came out in 2001. It wasn't until 2007 that the iPhone came out uh, and changed sort of that world. And so there was a, a few years where the development of technology in the iPod actually influenced the early development of the iPhone. So we're back to this question about how do we store information. And again, as we talked about last time, in the 1930s, 40s and onward, people uh, experimented with and used magnetic tape storage, first discovered or engineered by the Germans and then spread across the rest of the world following the end of World War II. And again, these systems are very much still in effect, uh, but they do not have the fastest uh, ability to read and write information. Um, if you've had an older magnetic hard drive and in recent years replaced it with a solid state hard drive, you may have noticed a difference. Uh, there are ultimately now faster ways to store and access information that we use these days. And that's sort of the broad umbrella topic that we want to take on in this discussion. So again, uh, the question is, how do we store information? But this is specifically, how do we store information in an electrical circuit using electrical properties of materials. Not the magnetic properties of materials, but electrical properties of materials. Well, one way uh, is that you can build an electric circuit and have a whole bunch of switches in that electric circuit, and those switches will act like the ones and zeros that are in the binary system. Again, previously we've talked about north and south are one binary option. Well, an on or an off switch is another good binary option, and uh, you could think of this as a whole bunch of electrical switches, which is where we're going. But if it helps you, some people have an easier time thinking about this stuff with like water flow. So if you've ever seen a system where there's a whole bunch of water pipes and they're each controlled by their own valve, same idea there, right? If you have the valve open, water is flowing through the pipe. That's one state of the system. And if you have the valve closed and no water is flowing through, that's another state of the system. So I have all my switches. And then if I want those switches to store information, I do so in a digital binary fashion. Uh, and so I turn some of the switches on, leave some of the switches off, and this could be, for example, the binary 0101010, uh, and that would mean some information uh, within my circuit. But one of the real problems in an electric circuit with doing this is while the power's on, while the computer's running, this works great. But as soon as you power it off, it turns out the switches lose their information in the traditional way that we think about these switches because you don't want to have somebody you know, in the computer manually flipping all the switches. That's even much less effective than magnetic storage. Uh, and so these are going to be controlled by other electric circuits. And as soon as those electric circuits lose their power, they lose the power to control the switches and the switches all revert to the state of being off. So if you are okay with having a computer that just, you know, every time you turn it off, loses everything you worked on, then great. You, you can do this with a simple set of switches. Um, I can remember too, in the early days of personal computers at home, you would have a magnetic tape recorder that was connected to the computer. And anything you'd done on the computer that you wanted to save, you had to save it onto that. Because if you shut down the computer, it would not be stored. There was no hard drive in some of those early computers. Um, so, obviously, we moved past that. How did we do that and take on that engineering challenge? Well, the attempt to do that and to store information in an electric circuit actually started more than 100 years ago when people started experimenting with vacuum tubes. So vacuum tubes are broadly, uh, usually they're made out of some sort of glass casing, and they have two or more electrodes that are buried within those. 
One of those electrodes often has a filament on it, like a light bulb filament. And so when you heat up the electrodes, that filament will heat up and some of the electrons that are on there will actually boil off, if you will, uh, and leave that. If the other electrode is positive, then you get electrons to flow from the negative uh, electrode to the positive electrode. And it turns out that if you insert additional electrodes in the path, which are often called gates, um, you can control this flow of current within this vacuum tube. So this is, if you think about it, a switch, because if the voltage is on, current is flowing through the vacuum tube. If the voltage is off, there's no current flowing. So you can actually use vacuum tubes uh, to make a computer. And people actually did this. Uh, and um, vacuum tubes came in a still do, come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And you can see, uh, if you look at the picture carefully there, that many of those vacuum tubes have five, six, eight little pins down on the bottom, which means they have many, many, many electrodes in them. Uh, and they do um, more complicated electronic functions. But uh, vacuum tube computers did exist. This is a replica of an early vacuum tube computer that was at Iowa State University down in Ames. Uh, and I can't, I don't know, it, it looks like there is in probably the hundreds of vacuum tubes that are in layers within that device. And I don't even know what that machine did. Maybe it added two numbers together. You know, the, the early computers were not fantastically fast at processing things, uh, nor they were fantastically powerful, but they were important in the developing of our ideas about how electronic circuits work. One of the drawbacks of a vacuum tube computer is that, you know, you got to heat things up to move current in these vacuum tubes. So it generates quite a lot of heat. And it's a similar problem to the incandescent light bulb, right? Your computer is functionally not very uh, efficient. It's losing a lot of energy to heat. Um, another problem is that, you know, it takes time for these vacuum tubes to warm up. And so actually the time to transmit information through these early computers was fairly slow. Well, about the same time vacuum tubes were coming into being manufactured, people started to actually mess around with other ways to make switches within computers. Uh, and so there was a lot of experimenting done with semiconductor material. And we've talked about these a couple of times previously when we talked about diodes uh, and the like. So semiconducting material, the most common one is silicon, but there's other ones that are in a similar area of the periodic table. Germanium is an important one since it was actually the first recognized transistor base material. Uh, but recall from previous discussions, we've talked about how when you have lots of atoms together, you no longer have really distinct energy levels. You have these bands of energy levels due to the close proximity of these atoms. And so whatever level you've filled electrons up to in the lowest energy state is referred to as the Fermi level. If you have a conductor, uh, it has, uh, you know, some openings in the electronic uh, holes within a given level so that electrons, if you push uh, electrons through that material, they will flow from one side to the other and form an electric current. If you have an insulating material though, usually the energy states in the lower bands are completely filled and then the energy states in the upper bands are completely empty. And unless you apply a lot of energy to that system to give the electrons in the valence band enough energy to jump up to the conduction band, you don't get any flow through a system like this. We've also previously talked about using P-type semiconducting materials, which have a partially filled valence band, and N-type semiconducting materials, which have a partially filled conducting band, in concert to form a diode. In previous discussions, we've talked about the, the, the characteristics uh, of a diode. Here in a minute, we're going to use a simulator, which will revisit this topic before we move on and talk about how you make a transistor, which is basically add one more layer. So this is the FET semiconductor simulator. And again, it's one of these older simulators that runs on Java. If you know how to bypass the Java on your computer, I would encourage you to play around with it. It doesn't take very long to learn how to use this particular simulator. But the things we want to ask about are what happens when you complete a circuit with an N type of semiconducting material. So you can set the simulator to have just one piece of semiconducting material. Uh, what about if you complete it with a P type instead? And what happens if you switch the battery around so that one side's positive and then the other side is positive later? How does that circuit behave? 
Uh, and finally, because we want to think about how semiconductors work together to make these diodes and now today transistors, uh, what happens when you put two of those layers together? So again, the hope is that you will explore with that simulator if that's a possibility on your end. If it's not a possibility or you just prefer, I've done uh, the simulation exercises that answer those questions in the YouTube video that's linked here on this slide. So, uh, the first, I believe, if I'm remembering the order here, yes, the first Poll Everywhere survey question of this particular set. If you insert a one layer semiconductor into a circuit, so just one material, how is current flow affected? Is it no current's going to flow? Is it that current flows clockwise around the circuit but not counterclockwise? Is it that current flows counterclockwise around the circuit but not clockwise? Or is it that current will flow in either direction? So again, if you've experimented with a simulator, you know the answer to this question. If not, you might want to jump back and either do the experiment or watch that YouTube video. So now let's talk about the main piece that is the switch, the core of these modern electronic circuits. Uh, so transistors were first thought about, hinted at, with uh, some patent applications by a guy named Julius Lillianfield in the 1920s. He filed his patent first in Canada and then in, then in the United States. And I believe he was awarded this patent because the folks that came and did the work after him uh, were aware of his work. Uh, and he had the first patent for a field effect transistor, a transistor that would be controlled by the application of an electric field. Turns out that's the most common use of transistors today. But the first folks that were recognized with making the transistor, not only just having the concept and getting it patented, but actually producing it, were a team that worked at Bell Labs. So I believe Bardeen, John Bardeen and Walter Bratton were the, the two scientists that did the experiment. And uh, William Shockley was their supervisor. Uh, and in the 1940s, 1947 specifically, uh, right before Christmas, they engineered the first point contact transistor. Uh, and then they worked out a bipolar junction transistor the following year. Uh, and they won the Nobel Prize for this, though the Nobel Prize has this lag time. So it was eight years before they won because it always, you always have to, you know, was this idea big? Did it change the world? And the answer is absolutely. Your life is very different now with the uh, use of transistors in many, many, many things in your life. Um, so this picture is, I, I don't know if it's a replica or the original one, but the original transistor that they engineered in this Bell Lab uh, still works and uh, is still in existence today and can still be used, though obviously like everything in an electronic setting, it's gotten much, much smaller, uh, tiny, tiny transistors when it comes to talking about circuit boards. It was uh, some more researchers at Bell Labs about a decade later that are credited with making the first uh, type of transistor that is the most widely used transistor today, and that's the MOSFET. That stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. And so the metal oxide semiconductor is talking about the combination of materials that make up the semiconductor. The field effect transistor is talking about using electric fields to control it rather than these point contact transistors. And so MOSFETs, uh, there's a picture of a MOSFET at the top of this slide. They are the most widely uh, used type of transistor today, but they can be made very, very, very tiny. So the other picture in the slide there is a picture from Berkeley Lab from a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is a basically an engineered transistor. It has the same function of a transistor. Uh, and you can see the scale there is the, the whole picture is about 20 nanometers wide. So they are getting these things very, 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 very small. But uh, scientists that are working on this stuff today are running up against problems because we're getting to the limits of as small and as thin and as fast as we can make things uh, until we get into something like, say, quantum computing. So what is a semiconductor? Well, it's really a sandwich of different materials, but very often diagrammatically it's drawn something like this. You start out with some sort of semiconducting material that is considered a p-type semiconducting material. So the early one at the Bell Labs, I believe, was germanium. Uh, and then you put two types, uh, two rather n-type semiconductors onto either end through a variety of means. 
uh, and you can make these things large, but obviously they've figured out ways to make them very, very, very small. Um, then those two n-type semiconductors is where you're going to connect two wires, and this is where you ultimately want a current to flow through this device. So in the language of electronics, we call one side the source, where current will be produced and in, pushed into this semiconductor. The other side is the drain. Uh, again, you can think of water analogies for here, if you will. But because these are semiconductors, and because when they get together, uh, they completely fill the valence region and the conduction region is completely empty, they act very much like a diode where you're going the wrong way. Current will not flow through them on their own. We have to control that uh, ability to have some current. And so the way this is done is to put a thin layer of conducting material that's connected to a different part of an electric circuit. And this is referred to as the gate. Kind of like when you open up the gate, you allow things to go through. When you close the gate, you stop. So the gate is controlling current flow through this transistor. But we don't want that conducting material touching the semiconductor, because if it were, then current would just flow through the conducting material all the time, and the two circuits would be electrically connected to each other. So the semiconductor sandwich, if you will, is covered with a thin layer of insulating material, and the thinner the better for the purposes here. Uh, and people have gotten them into you know a couple of atoms width of thinness here. Um, so you've got an insulating material, and then the conducting material of the gate. So how does this work? Well, when you have uh, the n-type, p-type, n-type, the n-type, uh, the electrons that are up in the uh, conduction band of the n-type will uh, deplete down into the depletion region in the p-type and fill in all the holes in that p-type so that you're left with this situation that's schematically there on diagram A where you have a completely filled valence band uh, and then no ability to move through the conduction band because within that depletion region, the conduction band is completely empty. And again, you don't have enough energy in the system without destroying the transistor to give charges enough energy to jump up to those higher levels and flow across. But the gate helps you out here because if you charge the gate positively, it's going to create an electric field and that electric field will attract some of the electrons up from the lower level to the higher levels and then when you have a partially filled conduction band within that region, it's no longer considered a depletion region and current will flow through here. So broadly what happens when you turn on the gate and have positive charge on it, charge flows through this semiconductor in a different electric circuit. When you discharge the gate, charge stops and it doesn't flow and there is your electrical state of being a one or a zero. It still doesn't solve your problem of storing information when the computer's turned off. And so the way they accomplish this is to add actually another layer of conducting material. So you have in your sandwich insulating materials, but now two conducting layers. And the conducting material on the top is still the gate. It's still controlling the function of the transistor. But then you have an intermediate conducting layer. And that intermediate layer can be charged or discharged through a phenomenon known as quantum mechanical tunneling, which I'm not going to really get into here. It's a fairly complicated thing that you learn about in quantum mechanics courses. Uh, but broadly, uh, charges have some probability of ending up where traditional laws of physics would say they can't go. And so because there is some probability of charging this thing up at the right energy levels, Turns out these conducting materials do get charged. And so they can hold charge even after the power is turned off everywhere else in the circuit because they are electrically isolated. They're not connected anywhere where they're going to discharge through any part of the circuit. Then you have to pull some wizardry on the other end to read that they were actually charged by discharging them. And you, through your circuit, then recharge them again if you want them to keep storing the information that they were storing. So it's a little complicated, but if you can make many, 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 many of these, you have many, many, many switches, and you can store a lot of information in your iPod, in your computer, in your smartphone. So that's briefly my angle on how a transistor works. Uh, in the textbook, obviously, Bloomfield is going to have a couple of pages on that, and I hope you, you will read that. If you like another angle at these things or prefer learning through multimedia, I've linked to a couple of YouTube videos here that also explain the basic physics behind how a transistor works. Uh, and they've got, you know, multimedia in there. So I would encourage you to watch one or the other of those uh, if that seems 
like something that you would enjoy doing. So uh, a couple more questions on our Poll Everywhere survey. If uh, any of this previous uh, few slides made sense, what does a transistor do? Does it allow the current in one circuit to control current in another circuit? Does it allow only one-way current flow? Does it limit current that's flowing in a circuit? Or does it store energy in the magnetic field? A little bit more of a challenging question, probably. Dynamic memory in your computer, or your iPod, or any of these kinds of devices stores bits as the absence or presence of separated charge on tiny capacitors. That little layer that's electrically insulated from the rest of the semiconductor, the rest of the transistor, is considered a capacitor. So making the insulating layers of those tiny capacitors as thin as possible actually reduces the energy that you need to store charge on them by either putting charge there or reading charge off of them. Uh, which is considered recording a bit, a one or a zero in digital state. So is that energy reduced because the separated charges have less momentum when they're stationary on opposite sides of a thin insulator than when they are stationary on opposite sides of a thick insulator? Is it because a thin insulator is better conductor of electricity than a thick insulator? Is it because bringing those opposite charges closer together reduces their overall electrostatic potential energy? Or is it that a thin insulator is less magnetic than a thick insulator? Final thing we want to touch on a little bit, and again, Bloomfield touches on this in the text a bit, is, is how do you do all the things you need to do internally in a computer to make all of this uh, stuff go? So you can store information in a whole series of ones and zeros, but you need to, at times, process information and turn one kind of information into another kind of information. Well, computers are governed by a branch of mathematics called Boolean logic. And Boolean logic is all about how you do math with ones and zeros. And the rules of it are a little bit different than the math you and I probably remember learning in elementary school. Um, you can think of this as either ones or zero states. And now folks that do logic within philosophy think of this as states of being true or false. But any sort of two-state system will work with this kind of logic. And there are three basic functions in Boolean logic. And so one is called the AND function. And so what that means is it is true if both statements feeding into something are true and it's false otherwise. What does that look like in ones and zeros? Well, imagine I have two uh, bits that are in my computer. If bit one is a zero and bit two is a zero and I combine them with this AND function, they will produce a zero because they are both zero. If I have zero and one, that still is a zero because I need to have both be a one in order to make a binary one. So 0 and 1, 1 and 0 both make 0, and 1 and 1 make 1. The sort of reverse of that is an OR statement, which is the little V downward symbol in this Boolean logic. Uh, and it's true if anything is true. So if you have 0 and 0, which would be like false and false, then the answer is 0 or false. But if you have 0 and 1, 1 and 0, 1 and 1, all of those have at least one of the factors that is a 1. Uh, and so those are all true states or 1 states. And the third thing you need to base everything off of is called a not function. It just flips the value. So if something was true, then it becomes false. If something is false, then it becomes true. And there are places that you can poke around that people have some pretty good tutorials if this intrigues you about, you know, like how do you think about things in a Boolean fashion? Um, well, an and statement but it might be like, I will go eat lunch when I've finished teaching my 10 o'clock class and I've recorded this lecture. So I'm not going to go do lunch until I've done both of those things. Um, or statement would be like, I will, I don't know, we will go to the store when we run out of milk or we run out of toilet paper in this coronavirus, right? And so either of those being true will trigger that action. Uh, and the not is a case where you want to flip a switch from its current state to another state because you want the reverse of something. Um, so some people also uh, visualize these things with a series of Venn diagrams. So here's a Venn diagram representation, and this has much more than just and, or, or not. But notice 
A is the left circle all colored in, B is the right circle all colored in. So A and B is only on a Venn diagram the area where those two circles overlap. Um, whereas A or B, which is down here at the bottom of the chart, is both circles completely colored in because it's any of those things. Um, but if you have not A or not B, um, you, you get these states. Here's A not B, right? The only the portion of A that doesn't overlap B. Here's B, the only portion that doesn't overlap A. And so what people actually have figured out to do, engineers over the last 80 years now, is to use combinations of transistors to actually make computers do these operations. To take two bits and combine them into one bit, and that bit might be a one if both are one, or it might be a one if only one is a one, or it might be a one if both are zero. And using these operations and then operations based on these operations can lead you to do everything you ever wanted to do in a computer. So if you ever look at a circuit diagram, you might see some of these logic gate symbols. An AND is, at least in the American scheme, this sort of, I don't know, half circle with a flat end. There's two gates that feed into an AND part and one that goes out. An OR is uh, just, I guess, curved at the back in this scheme. Um, and a knot is the triangle. And then you can have combinations of these things, AND, AND, N, OR, X, OR, and keep combining these logical operations to do newer and newer kinds of things. Um, and so very often, if you look in a computer or a phone and you see a chip that looks like the one up here, it has a whole bunch of transistors, you know, tens or hundreds or even thousands of these transistors doing a whole series of these operations to give the chip a very specific function and a very specific purpose. So uh, is there just going to be more and more transistors? Well, I think this is kind of interesting history over the last 20 years. The first generation iPod contained about 70 million transistors. So they are not at all on the size of, you know, like this is a, a resistor, not a transistor, but they're not at all on the size of these kinds of components, right? They're tiny, tiny, tiny things that are actually printed onto circuit boards rather than soldered by some electrical engineers. Uh, so 70 million transistors, quite a lot in that first generation iPod. Uh, but by the time we've gotten to the iPhone 11, uh, it's gone up quite a lot. 8.5 billion transistors within the circuits within the iPhone 11. Uh, and there is a law in semiconductors called Moore's Law uh, that describes uh, that the rate of trend, the number of transistors within circuits should increase uh, and double uh, I think every two years is the, yeah, doubles every two years in Moore's Law. So you can see on this graph, uh, very small font in here, but if you go to Wikipedia and read about the transistor history, you will you can find this. So this is the early ones in 1970, right, that computers that had, oh, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 transistors. And now we're up here uh, later than 2018, but as late as 2018, uh, there were computers that contained 50 billion transistors within them, uh, which is quite an accomplishment. Again, there's some wonder about this probably can't continue forever because at some point we're approaching the limits of atomic size in the circuitry that we print within the computers. And this has led some folks to delve into new kinds of computers, such as quantum computing, to see uh, if you can make a fundamentally different kind of machine and push computing power further than it is today. So that's what we wanted to talk about in this particular lecture. Again, I would encourage you to read section three and chapter 14 out of the Bloomfield text as well, since he goes into detail on some things that I haven't and vice versa. But we talked briefly about basically the, the circuitry, the electronics behind audio players, which is the same basic circuitry behind smartphones, behind modern computers and things of like this. They are vast, vast, vast networks of these transistors. But at the root level, a single transistor is nothing more than electrical switch that's controlled by another electrical circuit. So the control circuit can tell the switch whether to turn on or off and be in a state of one or zero. Transistors need to have three layers at least, and there are different kinds of transistors that have more layers, but three layers at least of semiconducting materials. We talked about an NPN kind, but you can also make a transistor that is a PNP and it has slightly different function. 
Current flow through the transition and the charge state, if it's made to store charge, are controlled uh, by a current flow in that gate circuit. And finally, you can combine transistors in fantastic ways to do all kinds of operations. And at the root, the logic behind those operations is something called Boolean logic, the rules for dealing with combinations of binary ones and zeros. Yeah, the Chapter 14 quiz should be available online shortly uh, and available until Monday at 2. And that's the last quiz because we don't have a Chapter 15 quiz. We have a final exam instead that will come up uh, during finals week. Again, more details on that will follow shortly in the announcements, so keep an eye on your email. If you want to look ahead to next week, we'll be talking about the sections of Chapter 15 uh, and specifically Section 1 on Monday.